It's great to have you in the house. And uh, we are in our series called Me, Myself, and I. And uh, I, I hope that it, it literally, you know, uh, convinced you of doing and making proper decisions. If you didn't do that yet, hopefully by today you will, and by next week you will again, because that's ultimately why we want to do this. We want to help you make better decisions at the end of the day. So I'm talking today about redefining your friendship. How do I redefine my friendship? What's those things that I literally have to redefine? Because we want to bring the best. Your friends is supposed to bring the best out of you. <laughs> Last week, Alan Sutton spoke and he said, in marriage, your wife or your husband needs to bring the best out of you. If they don't bring the best out of you, guess what? They bring the worst out of you. You know, it's normally saying, but every time you guys argue, like, you always bring the worst out of me. You make me this monster. Like, uh, but when you were dating, you didn't say that. You're like, oh, you are such a lovable guy and blah, blah, blah. And how suddenly? But we want to help you not to bring the worst out of each other, but to bring the best out of each other. So we have this uh, marriage investment seminar, uh, the 3rd and the 4th of May. So don't miss it out. So all the ladies who's married, please just give your husband a notch and tell him we're going to be there. Just show him who's the, the boss in the house, please. <laughs> so please sign up after the service. There's a table outside as well to do that. But um, as we're going to continue today with the series, uh, Uversion, you can make notes on Uversion app. Go to events, Dr. Dale Raslo, and you can make notes there, and then just make sure that you save your notes after the service. The reason why I'm talking about redefining your friendship, it's absolutely essential for you as a Christ follower to make changes when it comes to friendship. You have to. It's impossible to live a life destined for Christ, devoted for Christ, without old friends. The friends that still knows you, they know your past. They, they still take you back to your past the whole time. So, but those are the things. So because whenever you make a change, change needs to happen. It's like my son. He went to another school or different school this year. In the beginning of the year, he went to a new school. And uh, the second day, I, I asked him, I said, hey, buddy, so tell me, how was your, how's your new school? How did it go? And he says, Dad, you won't believe me. It, it, I love my school. I said, why? He says, because there's a lot of guys and a lot of friends. They are the same color as you. <laughs> and I'm like, thanks, buddy. Appreciate that. Mom's child. <laughs> but, uh, but here's the thing. He just, he saw something different, and it challenged him because why? He's in a different scenario. He's in a different place, and he saw it. And you and I, being Christ followers, we need to make sure that our life change because we're following Christ with everything that we have. There's a saying, and somebody said this before. He said, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. For some of us sitting here, like, oh, Lord, really? I don't know about that, but it is, it is true. Because we, whenever you have friends around you, your friends help you to shape your reputation. They make sure that the reputation that you have is built. I remember when I was in school, I loved to hang out with the cool guys, the handsome guys, because I wanted to be like them. You want to do that. Why? Because your reputation matters to you. But when, I, when, when you get to know Christ, then your reputation is out of the equation. What really matters is your character because God wants your character to be built and shaped. That's what happens. And so you cannot live a life destined for greatness with your old life, with your old friends. Listen to this. Uh, Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, walk with the wise and become wiser. For a companion of fools, suffer harm. <laughs> you know, just think for a minute, for those of you that grew up in the East Rand, you would remember whenever you were in trouble, whenever you did something wrong, whenever something happened and uh, you were caught out, you were not alone. Friends were with you. 
They motivated you to do certain things which you didn't want to do. But they are the guys who helped you to shape your reputation. And for that, I wanted to have that reputation because it looked cool. It's like this lady, this video that I've watched the other day, this lady said to her husband, they were sitting on the couch and she looked at her husband and she said to him, I don't trust your friends. And he said, oh, baby, you know what? How can you not trust my friends? I mean, they often come here, you've seen them, they are men of you know, integrity, they have their own families. And she said to him, I don't trust your friends. And he said, how do you mean? He says, let me prove it. And she phones the friend. Hey, James, is Garrett, at, is Garrett there? Gareth is sitting next to her. And James is like, uh, yes, just hang on. J- Gareth! <laughs> He's quickly on the toilet. I'll, I'll let him call you back. Dip. And then she says, hang on, wait. And the next minute, James phones Gareth. Hey, Gareth, your wife's looking for you. You better call her. And the wife's just like, I told you so. You proved me wrong. Because why? Listen to this. Walk with the wise and you become... So the whole idea of today is literally to help you to shape your worldview when it comes to your friends, to help you understand that certain friends are good for you, but some of them are not good for you. Especially if you're a follower of Christ, it is important for you to make those harsh decisions right now because it will impact your life. It will, it will either destroy or build your life. Because if we just want to build our reputation, our reputation will destroy our character. And so it's important for us to do this. Listen to Proverbs 12, verse 26. It says, the righteous choose their friends carefully. Why? Because I'm a righteous person. I live with the conviction that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And out of that, I decide that I need to choose different friends. And then it says, but the way of the wicked leads them to astray. Because sometimes we meet friends and we become friends with people next to the sport field or wherever, at a wedding, wherever. You meet, you meet up with people, they become your friends, but here's the thing, we deepen our friendship by the decisions that we make for each other. If we don't do that, the question are, are they really good for me? Are they really there for me? Because it is impossible to live a righteous life when you have wrong friends. It's impossible. And I know all the ladies, thank you. I'll have an extra offering after the service because you are agreeing with me this morning. But the husbands, the men, you sitting here, you will also vouch for that. And say, I've seen this in my own life. I've seen this. This is not a statement that somebody made. It is scripture. Listen to this. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. It's not a saying that somebody else said, a quote, a nice quote that you print out and put it on your, on your fridge magnet. It's literally scripture. And Paul is actually talking to the Corinthians church and telling them, listen, you want to obey this and that and you want to do all these other things. What I'm telling you is come back to your senses. Stop sinning. Stop deviating away from God's plan for your life because of your friends. Stop that because they are literally destroying your character. They are corrupting your character. It's time for us to start building again those boundaries around us and say, you know what? They are not good for me. They are not good for us. We need to make those decisions. Because the friends that you have now, are they there to make an impact or contribute to your life? Or are they only there to take away from your life? Just think for a minute. Because sometimes... God removes people out of your life. Please, people, don't go run after them. And if you want to ask me why, I'll tell you stories of why. Because iron as iron sharpens iron, so friends sharpen friends. That's what is all about. That's the important part of this. And so here's two characteristics that I want to help you to understand. Why am I saying this? First of all, distract people that you have. And I've got a preacher that's going to preach with me just now. Come stand here next to me. And so because you have friends that sometimes distract you from God's plan for your life. The people that say it's not good for you. No, man, 
Don't do those things. Remember what we've done in the past, and now they want to take you back to that. There are people in your life that want to literally distract you from God's plan for your life. And you have to stand firm and say, I'm not going to do this. Matthew 16, verse 23, it's in the time where Jesus said to his disciples, I'm about to go away. I'm about to be crucified. I'm about to die for what I am about to do in this life. That was the cause that I came. That was the mission so that I can die for the people, so that I can redeem them out of the hand of Satan. And this is what I'm about to do. And then Peter, out of his you know, character, he re- reprimanded Jesus, and he said, no way, you can't do that. We want you to be with us. We want you to be here close to us because we've experienced your goodness. We've experienced the miracles that you've done. I mean, we never went to bed hungry. Why? Because Jesus just spoke a word, and he can make food. Because it's for our own convenience sake. We don't want you to go away. You know what Jesus said? Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He didn't speak about your mother-in-law, okay? Just to say. (laughs) All the mother-in-laws that's here, (laughs) forgive me. He says to him, get behind me, Satan. Why? He says, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the mind that concerns God, but merely of human concern. You think like human beings. You think about the need that you have right now. God is saying, no, no, I've got a bigger plan. Don't let these things distract you from the plans that I have for you. It might not seem the way you actually wanted to, the outcome to be, but it's, actually, it's still God's plan. It's still, I remember we got engaged, and we were around about two months engaged, and uh, we were starting to plan our marriage, because if you are engaged... The idea to be engaged is to get married. Amen? So if you are engaged and you don't have a a date, I will do it for free. Come speak to me. Okay, all the ladies, yes, see another offering. So (laughs) I remember we were engaged and we we had a plan, you know, uh, we're starting to plan our marriage, our, our, our wedding day. And I remember we went to Bri with these friends. So-called friends. And we were sitting there, and we were having a nice braai. In fact, I remember up until today what we ate. It was really delicious. They had a nice lamb. What do you call it? Leg of lamb. Oh, it was delicious. It was, uh, it was really amazing. It was great. The food was great. The company, not so great. But the food was great. And I remember that day, they said to us when we said, oh, we engage and, and we already have our date, etc., etc." And they said, oh, now you're going to start fighting and arguing. And you're going to see, even in your marriage, you're going to argue. And they were married already. And this is what you're going to do. You're going to argue. You're going to fight about this and that, and that. And I'm looking at my wife and I realize, mm-mm. And we walked out there. And my wife and I said, we don't need these friends in our lives. We don't need them because they are distraction for God's plan for our lives. We didn't invite them to our wedding. (laughs) Because we only invite the people who celebrate the goodness of God in our lives. I normally say when I do weddings, I always say, I'm not gonna ask objection because you are invited. So don't put up your hand. <laughs> leave if you don't agree what's going on here. Yeah. <laughs> but leave because you are only invited. You are invited to celebrate the goodness of God in these people's lives. Now you want to be a distraction. Come on, people. Why do we invite those type of people? Why? They're only a distraction for God's plan in your life. Stop being the keep up with the Joneses and making sure that everybody knows about you because you only want to build your reputation. God wants to build your character. Stop that. And so those people are there to distract God's plan. They want to demolish God's plan over your life. Another characteristic is those are the people that continue taking you back to your old life. Hey, remember when we were young? When we didn't have children? Remember how we used to have money? (laughs) Remember... 
You could buy anything, all the shoes. We could do all these things. Listen, can I just tell you, the older you get, the more you, uh, let me say, not older, the more you become in advanced in life. <laughs> all the elderly people, thank you. Appreciate it. The more you become advanced in life, you realize what is most important in your life. The more you become advanced in life, the more you are willing to sacrifice. The more you are willing to give certain things up for the sake, listen to this, for the sake of other people. Because that's what friendship is all about as well. I'm willing to do this. Romans 6 verse 1 to 2, Peter, uh, Paul says this. He says, what shall we then say? Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? Are you going to go back to your old life because you know that Jesus died for you? Because you know you're convinced, you know that there is grace. Are you going back to your old self the whole time? And then you're like, oh, I'm so sorry, I did it again. What are you about to do? It's like when Peter, when, when, when Peter said, Jesus, come on, you can't do this. You can't just go, it's for our own convenience sake. When he reprimanded Jesus, it's actually at that moment where he realized, I've messed up. <laughs> because Jesus turned to him and said, get behind me, Satan. It's at that moment. So Paul says the same thing. He says, come on, guys. Are we going back to our old self the whole time? He says, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. How can we live in it any longer? I can't do this anymore. Why? Because I'm a new, newly born again Christian. I'm redeemed. I'm baptized. I speak in tongues. Whatever. I'm a new person, a new creation. I can't think like the old Llewellyn. I can't have and associate myself with the old Llewellyn anymore. Whatever the, the convictions was with the old Llewellyn, I can't let people associate with him. I need to associate with the new person. I can't. And so sometimes we think, oh, but Lou Allen, I know you're sitting here in church, and it's not just you, the guys who's watching online as well. Yeah, but Lou Allen, they also need Jesus. They've been your friends for the last five years, and? Are they born again? Just be honest. I know you can feel the tension in your heart, like, hey, this Muruti, this morning. The fact of the matter is, maybe you are not the savior that they need, but Jesus is. Maybe you should distance yourself from them and saying, Jesus, you take the wheel. It's like this auntie who's driving a car, and the next minute she saw, hey, she's going to roll this car, and she leaves the wheel and says, Jesus, take the wheel. And they ask her what happened. She said, I don't know, Jesus, he made the accident. He rolled the car three times. <laughs> no, not when in crisis time. Make the decision before then and, say, and realize they're not good for me. They are the distraction for God's plan in my life. They continue to take me back to my old life. I don't need them in my life right now. But please don't jump the gun. I'll tell you later on what Jesus did. But continue to taking you back. There's a story in the Bible of the story about Job. We all know the story of Job, an amazing guy who the Bible says had no evil in his life, no sin. In fact, he honored God and he shunned evil. That's what the Bible says. He was a man after God's heart. He was a man who lived with obedience, everything. And at a stage, Satan came to God and said to God, listen, you say that this guy, Job, he's a guy who would literally have no sin. Give me a day with him and I'll show you that he will deny you. Let me tempt him and I'll show you, he will deny you. And at that moment, we know the story of Job. Job literally lost everything in a day. Everything. The Bible actually says the moment every time the messenger came to Job and said to Job, Hey Job, you know, all your animals, they were out there. And what happened was a fire, uh, uh, the, the field caught fire and all of them burned out. And here he's standing, and while this messenger is giving him the message, another messenger came and said to him, hey, your family was busy socialing together, and the roof collapsed, and all of them died. 
And another messenger came in, and Job lost everything. The Bible says he tore his clothes of his body, and he said, Naked I came into this world, naked I will depart. May the name of the Lord be praised. How many of us will say that? When you lose your job, how many of us will say, hey, may the name of the Lord be praised. I just lost my job. Woo-hoo. We don't know what we're going to eat tomorrow, but woo-hoo, praise God. <laughs> People are going to think you're crazy. And Job says, listen, this is what it is. And then he says this, in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Any wrong. <laughs> he says, I know God will provide. But then he had three friends who heard about the things that Job's going through. And they actually said, hey guys, let's, let's come together. They made a group chat, WhatsApp call, <laughs> and said, hey, we need to go and visit Job because he is not in a good place. He's in a good state of mind. Let's go and visit him. Let's go and support him. Let's be there for him as our friend. Let's just be there. Let's just comfort him in this time and in this season because he is our friend. And listen to this. And so Job 2 verse 11 verse 12, uh, 11 to 12 says, Eliphaz from uh, Taman, Bildad from Shua, and uh, Zophra from Namar with three of Job's friends, and they heard about his trouble. So they agreed to visit Job and comfort him. When they came near enough to see Job, they couldn't hardly recognize him. And in their great sorrow, they tore their clothes, then sprinkled dust on their heads and cried bitterly. Another translation said, they had good intentions to comfort him. They had good intentions. Do you also have those friends who literally, when you're going through tough times, they have good intentions to say, hey, buddy, it's okay. They are really there to to support you. They are there to help you through your misery, help you through the sorrow. They They are there. They look like godly friends. And these friends of Job got to a place that every time that Job said to them, guys, it's okay, I'm okay. God's going to come through for me. And then they said, what? Are you crazy? Look where you are at. You've lost everything and you still trust in God. Maybe it's time for you to turn your back on God because it's not God. This is not the God that we know that will do this to you. You've lost your job and you're like, praise God. I know God's going to provide. And your friends are saying, no, I don't think it's God that made you lost your job. It's not. No, no, no. And we think like that because we have a preconceived idea of how God works. Isn't it? Because we know. We know how God works. This is the pattern of God. Listen, God doesn't care about how you think he's going to act. God cares. God acts how he wants to act. Because if he wants, if he cares about how you think he acts, then he's not God. He's God because he can do whatever he wants to do. Yes, God will meet you at the level of your expectation. And so they're saying, but why don't you turn your back on God? Why don't you, if this is the way God deals with you, maybe it's time for you just to curse God and move on. Because they tried everything. Hey, Job, maybe there's something in your life. You are sinning against God. Maybe you should repent and God will turn everything back into order. And Job says, guys, come on. I know my heart. I know what's going on in my heart. I've seen God work in my life like never before. Now you want to tell me this is not God? One of the commentaries said, God, uh, Job said to his friends, I knew my heart. My heart is clean. There's nothing sinful in my life, guys. I'm okay. I'm trusting God for breakthrough. I know God's going to come through for me. And these friends couldn't believe Job at, at, at that moment. Listen, listen to 1 Thessalonians. When I read this, I realized this is actually what happened to them. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. Our purpose is to please God, not people. (laughs) He is the one who examines the motives 
of our hearts. And so sometimes our motives are fine. Because my motive is there to support him. My motive is to say, I told you so. Remember when you told me you're going to marry this girl and I told you not to marry her. And now you've got big problems. A good friend will say, hey, buddy, I'm so sorry. But maybe let's journey together. Let's make sure that you come out on the other side. Because you know what? I believe God is busy building your character, not your reputation, your character. You're going to come out of this. It's okay. It's, it will happen. It's okay. This will be a tough time, but it's okay. You're going to come out on top. It's okay. Let's just, let's just pull through. That's a godly friend. But they were saying, no, no. Stop. Turn your back on God. And Job said, not a chance. Not a chance. And Job actually went to God and said, God, I'm leaving them over into your hands. <laughs> I'm giving them in your hands. Listen, my wife always say this to me. Whenever I do something wrong, she says, mm -mm, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just giving you over to God. Enough. <laughs> like, okay, okay, I won't go play golf twice a week anymore. <laughs> All the golfers. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and so he said, I'm giving you over to God. And they actually reconciled with God because of the obedience of the word and with Job. In fact, they were literally, guys, they were literally the mouthpiece of Satan. That's how Satan used them to literally distract God's plan for, for, for Job. They were the mouthpiece of Satan so that they continue taking him back to his old life. And he says, no, something new is about to happen. Do you know those type of people? You don't need them in your life. And yes, I know you're sitting here saying, yeah, but Jesus was a friend of sinners. Although he hated and he distanced himself from hypocrites. Just go think for a minute. And so they ask the question is, are they your friends or are they hypocrites? Are they there for their own benefit? Are they there because they contribute from you? Or are you just giving and giving and giving and they only on the receiving end? Or are you also on the other side where they contribute to your life? If not, then the question is, are they taking you away, distract you from God's plan? Are they continuing taking you back to your old life? Because if they do, they are not good for you. That's not the people that God wants to be to you to surround yourself with because they are bad company and they are corrupting good character. Yes, you are the light to this world and God is calling you to literally shine your light in this world, but maybe they are not there for, for you. They are not. I know that Jesus loves everybody equally, but he never treated everybody equally. Just go think about it. He never because he knew what was important. He decided that he's going to choose 12, that he will impart himself into them. Well, there was three of them that was really close to him. And the more advanced I become in life, I realize I need friends that contribute to my life. And I can contribute to theirs. I know. And sometimes you need to make your circle smaller and not bigger. <laughs> smaller to say, I know you're going to contribute to my life. I need you in my life. It's those people that when they know you're in trouble, they are there. And they help you. They're there because they contribute to your life. They are there to keep you accountable to speak the truth in love with one another. They are there to say, go and ask for forgiveness. They're not talking with you. They're talking the truth. Maybe go and ask for forgiveness. Maybe just go in and speak the truth in love with that, people, with that person.